so you were saying there's some real potential issues with the idea of pursuing a kind of policy of universal vaccination, escape mutants, that might not be something all our viewers are familiar with. So uh, this gets to fundamentals of basically Darwinian evolution um, to, to really understand this. What the term escape mutants refers to is virus isolates that are no longer as susceptible to the control of infection and spread provided by the vaccine, by the immune response generated from the vaccine. So they are escaping immune surveillance provided by the vaccine. That's the nature of the term escape mutants. Mutants in that the viruses, there's another paper out um, recently that shows that the mutation rate of this uh, coronavirus is much higher than we had previously estimated. So uh, the way it works with virology is that it's as if you have, a, a, you're breeding a dog and you have a litter of dogs and you'll know that, you know, if you have six dogs, one or two of those are going to be pretty good keepers and you might want to sell the other ones off. For instance, if you're breeding for uh, the ability to hunt. In the case of a virus, it's like um, the parent virus has millions to billions of children. And many of those have genetic modifications, mutations, that make them genetically different from the source virus. And this works for viruses because they only have to, in a small number of particles, infecting a third person, another person, is sufficient to rekindle the whole infection cycle. I was talking to a friend of mine, Chad Roy, who's a primatologist that's working with the coronavirus down, uh, the SARS coronavirus down at the Tulane Regional Primate Research Center. And he has some interesting data that's going to come out soon, where they're tracking the evolution of the virus during the course of infection in a given primate. And in his case, he was fascinated that he was seeing evolution of virus strains to become more able to infect uh, the gut and we're actually hiding in the gut. So this process of evolution, which also, by the way, occurs with AIDS, with the AIDS virus, you can track the genetic changes in the AIDS virus during the course of an infection. It's amazing to watch. So anytime a virus is infecting a, a host like us, it's generating these mutations all the time and it's constant, those mutations are constantly being selected for fitness is the technical term, right? The Darwinian term. They're being selected for fitness to reproduce. And what that means is that the environment of the host um, has things which restrict our immune system is the notable one. Restrict the ability of the virus to replicate and spread. And the virus and the host are in a constant battle where we're, our immune systems are adapting to try to control that virus, and the virus is constantly escaping those adaptations. And those are the ones that survive, right? Those yeah. are the ones that survive and, and get transmitted. They either replicate in the host or they get transmitted to third parties. So I'm going to cite another paper. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some really good veterinary work in what's called Merrick's disease, which is a inf viral infection of chickens. And this is what has many virologists concerned is as a model system. In the case of Merrick's disease, if you have an active outbreak of Merrick's disease in chickens and you start vaccinating against Merrick's disease during the outbreak, what you will do is drive the development of viruses that are able to escape the vaccine. And in the case of Merrick's disease, they actually become more severe in terms of the disease that they cause. So that's another one of those worst case scenarios, like I talked about high zone tolerance, and I previously talked about antibody dependent enhancement or vaccine enhanced infection or disease. There are these uh, situations in normal viral biology and, and uh, vaccinology that 
uh, give experienced uh, immunologists and vaccinologists a certain amount of concern and pause. And uh, based on Merrick's disease, a lot in other examples, there are many virologists, and I'm one of them, that are concerned that the policy of universal vaccination at the time when we are having a very active outbreak that's global creates the risk that we will drive the immune response of the entire population towards a single endpoint, towards a common outcome in terms of antibody responses. And there's another very nice paper just out recently from Michael Diamond's laboratory at Washington University that shows that in fact, um, we are getting remarkably consistent B cell responses to the vaccination. So we're driving, we, there's an appearance that in the effective antibodies, there's a small number of epitopes that are protective in spike. And by only using spike as an antigen, we're driving all of our immune responses towards some common endpoints of immune response against certain domains in spike. And uh, there it can be shown that viruses are evolving during the course of this infection and the use of vaccine in this way to start to escape those selective pressure from antibodies against those certain domains. Spike is an interesting protein. It has a lot of sugars all over it and other things that are used to evade immune response al already. So the concern is that by deploying vaccine broadly, the same basic vaccine, all these genetic vaccines all employ spike as an antigen. We're driving the whole human race towards a common endpoint and we're driving the virus that's infesting us to evolve to escape that common endpoint. And there, there is a risk that at some point in time, we may have basically a superbug evolve, um, which will now evade that immune response. Now, the, uh, an example that your listenership may understand better is the idea of antibiotic resistance. When we deploy antibiotics unnecessarily and very widely, we know that we develop antibiotic resistant bacteria. The same concept applies in vaccinology with viruses. So what would happen should we have an emergent super virus that is able to evade these spike vaccines? It is likely that it would cause disease in those that have only received vaccine as opposed to those that have had natural infection and have much broader immune responses. Um, and it would place those that have primarily relied on vaccine for protection that are at risk, high risk of disease and death. In other words, the susceptible and elderly. Suddenly their first line of defense falls away because the vaccines are no longer effective. And so the risk is with this universal vaccination strategy by driving um, uh, the development of viruses that are able to evade the immune responses elicited by the vaccines, that we risk creation of, a, of virus strains that are able to evade that and Paradoxically, the people that it will put at risk are the very people that need the vaccine the most, which is our elders and, and those that have pre-existing medical conditions and morbid obesity. So the logic is vaccinate those, reserve the vaccine for just them, and don't vaccinate the general population that are at extremely low risk, fraction of a fraction of a percent. And, and some more studies that came out recently that basically verify that, I suppose. Yeah. There have been. There's been about three of them that have come out sequentially that are all consistent with this hypothesis. So that's the other leg of the stool that's kind of caused um, 
some growing concern about our current public policy in vaccination is that we are seeing signs of the emergence of these vaccine escape mutants. And now there's a new strain popping up, I think, in South Africa that seems to be more resistant. And there are further evolution of the Delta strains that seem to be more resistant. So um, like with all science, we can't prove that this is going to happen. This is forward-looking risk assessment. Um, we're not there yet. Um, I would prefer that we don't get there. I think probably we can all agree on that. Um, I'm not saying that we're absolutely going to get there, um, but I'm saying that myself and many others believe that our current policy places at us at increased risk to having this kind of unpleasant outcome and losing the benefits of the vaccines, which, as I've mentioned, I believe in. I believe we've saved a lot of lives. I believe those benefits are best administered to the people that are most susceptible to death and disease and to reserve the vaccines for those people.